Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you guys for taking the time this evening to join us. Uh, my name is Ed Pritchard, and I work for Miami Eco Adventures. We're a division of the Parks Department here in Miami County. This webinar is a joint effort between UF IFS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, Miami Dade County Parks, and Miami Eco Adventures. For those new to our uh, uh, series, we welcome you and we thank you for taking the time. Just a few housekeeping items before we get the webinar started. Uh, everyone is currently on mute and your cameras are off. We ask that you remain that way, um, but we do encourage participation. You can send your questions. Uh, uh, to our presenter uh, through the chat box, which you can find on the bottom of your screen. Uh, I will be moderating that and we will take time at the end of the presentation to uh, do a Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded uh, and the link to the recording will be sent out uh, within the next week. So please share it with friends and colleagues. Um, you can also follow our uh, accounts on social media at Miami Eco Adventures and at Miami Dade Sea Grant. We share a lot of um, related content and we can also, we'll be sharing our upcoming webinar topics for this coming year. Um, this uh, program is a quarterly program. So uh, we'll definitely be sharing some of the information on our next talk coming up in May. If you'd like to receive an email reminder uh, with the upcoming topics, you can email Anna via the email that she'll place in the chat. And now without further ado, I'll turn it over to Anna for tonight's uh, themed presentation. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Ocean Romance, the Marvels of Marine Mating. Before we get into that, I'd just like to say hello and introduce myself. I am the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent for Miami-Dade County, and I am part of the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service and Miami-Dade County Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces. And UF IFAS Extension is here. There is an office in every single one of Florida's 67 counties to provide science-based information to help you do life better, improve your work, improve your life at home, and save the planet. And my role is as the Marine Science or Sea Grant Extension Agent and I work with people who rely upon the water for either their livelihood or their fun. So I work with boaters, fishermen, scuba divers, resource managers, and people in those types of groups. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about this theme, which was inspired by today's holiday of Valentine's Day. We'll start with a little bit of simple ecology principles followed by some vocabulary that'll be helpful that I'll be repeating a couple times throughout the presentation. Then I will be getting into animal behaviors. First, I'll give a few examples of invertebrates, and then I will talk about some popular vertebrate species. As Ed mentioned, and I just mentioned, I'll say it again, happy Valentine's Day. I just thought this was very appropriate a nifty little graphic I found online from the New England Aquarium. And if you're not familiar, this main organism here, this is a sea fan. So I thought they did a nice job of uh, a pun. So happy Valentine's Day from your biggest fan on our blue planet. All right, getting to business. Let's talk about ecology. And the first thing I'd like to introduce is the theory of R versus K selection. And this is relating to the selection of combinations of traits in organisms that trade off between the quantity and quality of offspring. And we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit deeper now. First, we'll look at our selected species. These are species that have very high mortality rates among their young. So in other words, they have a lot of babies, but that's because a lot of babies don't survive. And so these species are mostly tuned to put a lot of energy in reproduction and spend less energy in aftercare or parenting. So some common examples of this include 
species like rats, mice, and fish. So this is the example of quantity over quality. So more babies, but not so great. Now, when we compare that to the case-selected species, this is the other side of the coin. And these are species that have very low mortality rates at childbirth. They have few offspring, but put more energy into nurturing them and parenting them. And as an easy example, we humans, we generally speaking, only have one child at a time. There are cases, of course, of two twins and triplets and sometimes more, but generally speaking, we have one, one child at a time. And so as such, those fewer offspring can receive more aftercare, more nurturing and more parent parental supervision. And an example to us humans, other examples include other primates and whales and manatees. So less offspring, but higher quality individuals. We're gonna flip now and talk about vocabulary just to go over some terminology to make sure that we're all on the same page. First that, we're, that we'll cover is the word breed. And I don't mean this in the sense of what breed is your dog. However, we're talking about rather mating and producing offspring. Stress refers to a recurring period of sexual receptivity and fertility in many female mammals, or in other words, heat. Hermaphrodism is referring to the expression of both male and female reproductive function in a single individual. Mate is referring to animals coming together for the purpose of breeding. Spawning is intended not in terms of evil spawn, if you are a Grey's Anatomy fan, but rather the verb of to release or deposit eggs. And lastly, spawning aggregations are referring to a gathering of a marine animal at a density or a number that's at least four times greater than normal. So with those in mind, we're going to first look at a few key invertebrate species. And since we in South Florida are very fortunate to have the Florida Coral Reef Track in our backyard, what better way to start than with stony corals, which are animals, they are invertebrates in the Cnidarian family. And stony corals have two ways of reproducing. And the first that I'll discuss is their way of reproducing asexually. So this is also referred to as fragmenting or budding. And this is similar to what happens if you've ever taken a cutting from a plant to grow new plants. And in this way, the corals grow very, very quickly. They're able to reproduce and grow fast. And when I say here can frag or use coral, corals of opportunity, that simply means that you can take a cutting from a parent colony or a parent individual, or if there is a coral that has broken off and is rolling around on the ocean floor, that coral can also reattach itself to the bottom and continue growing. There are some benefits and drawbacks to this process. And the benefits are that, or this could be both a benefit and a drawback, is that asexual reproduction or fragmentation is essentially creating a clone. So you're creating a duplicate copy of the other individual. And this can be great if there are traits in that individual that are very, very strong or resilient. But on the flip side, if there are traits that are not so strong or so resilient, you are then, you are ending up with a duplicate that maybe isn't suited to do well in the environment. Something that's really cool is that this particular process of asexual reproduction has gained a lot more attention in the last 20 years or so because this is the approach that is used in coral gardening or coral farming activities. And that is what is reflected in the photo here. This is the main, the main approach that has been used to really bolster coral production. 
So a really interesting way of human intervention for coral production. And this is an example of a coral nursery in the Florida Keys. And aside from boats and time, it's a pretty cost-effective way to do things because all of the materials that are involved are pretty rudimentary. Things like PVC pipes and monofilament and styrofoam buoys, even that milk crate you see in the center of the screen, these are all items that you can either buy at a low cost or reuse because you found one on the side of the road. The second thing that we'll look at in terms of reproduction in corals are the sexual reproduction. And forgive me if I didn't say this earlier, but this isn't so much about marine mating, but this is a more general discussion about different ways of reproduction and behaviors do fold into that for some of the species that we're gonna look at. So with sexual reproduction, this is not mating exactly, but it is a very important reproductive process. And this is an annual event with a very targeted time. This happens based upon cues with the lunar cycle and water temperature in which corals will broadcast release their sperm and eggs into the water, which is what you're seeing in this photograph. And those sperm and egg bundles are known as gametes. So when this is happening, this is at night in pitch blackness, and those sperm and egg bundles, those gametes, have a very limited window of opportunity to come together and then settle and begin growth because those gametes are only viable for a short period of time. Those larvae and float for as little as a few days or even longer. And then once they settle on the ocean floor, they begin to grow. But it's a very slow process. And, and a good average, I shouldn't say a good average, an average is maybe four inches a year, but that really depends on the species. The branching corals, like you saw in the previous slide, those grow very, very quickly versus the mounding corals, like the one you see in this photograph, will grow maybe one to two inches at the most per year. And this is, this sexual reproduction is really important because it allows for greater genetic diversity in the reef versus the asexual reproduction, you are ending up with clones upon clones so that requires a little bit more monitoring and control to make sure that you're growing and cultivating genetic diversity. In this case, this is happening more naturally. And within the scientific community, there has been a greater effort in the last five years or so for scientists and research organizations to go out when the predicted spawning is supposed to happen and these groups go out with special containment devices to actually capture a lot of these gametes and bring them back and rear them in a lab to try and ensure their success, which is really, really cool. We're going to transition now. Oh, now, yep. And the success of this can be challenging because of those limited windows of opportunities. There's also challenges associated with predation and fish and other organisms eating those gametes. So now we're going to transition to another great invertebrate, and that's the Florida horseshoe crab. So this is the Limulus polyphemus. I love that scientific name. This animal will mate year round, but its peaks are during the spring and fall. And the horseshoe crabs will nest during the high tides associated with the new and full moons. And this is because that high tide puts their eggs in the right zone for success. These horseshoe crabs are coming ashore and laying their eggs in the sand. And so in this particular high tide zone, there is the right balance of oxygen availability and temperature. If the eggs are laid too low, the conditions will be too cold with not enough oxygen and if they lay the eggs too high, it's too hot and dry for the survivability. Horseshoe crabs take a pretty long time to reach maturity. They don't become reproductively mature for about eight to 10 years. And their nesting behavior is pretty unique among modern invertebrates. 
they come ashore in these attached pairs and the male latches onto the female from the back using this modified appendage. Its first claw looks like this little boxing glove. It's called a clasper. And using that clasper will latch onto the female. And the female will bury herself in the sand and lay several thousand eggs in a bunch and then move forward and repeat. And as she lays the eggs, the male horseshoe crab will fertilize those eggs externally with aquatic free, sp free swimming sperm. And interestingly, this isn't something you see too frequently here in Miami, but definitely in other parts of Florida, you will have the mating pair, which is in the center, surrounded by what are known as satellite males. And those satellite males are waiting for the female to lay her eggs in the sand so that they can also fertilize them. And this particular mating behavior increases the genetic diversity of the fertilized eggs. Those eggs are buried in the sand. They will hatch and emerge from the sand as larvae in about two weeks, depending on the temperature. And this external fertilization and aquatic free, free swimming sperm is unlike any other arthropod, but very likely quite similar to that of their primitive stem arthropod ancestors. So this process for the horseshoe crab has been going on for hundreds of millions of years. And an, on average, a female horseshoe crab will lay about 60,000 eggs per year in batches of about 2,000. We're gonna shift a little bit and look at a few examples now of vertebrates. And I just have to give the disclaimer that for the majority of what we're looking at, this isn't really a romantic thing. So just bear that in mind as we look at some of these examples. I'll start with the yellow-headed jawfish. Might be a little bit tough to decipher from this photograph, but these are very small fish at max four inches in length. And these are bottom-dwelling reef fish that dig burrows in the rubble or the sand using their mouths. And the male will court the female by swimming with its body arched and fins extended. The actual spawning will occur deep in the male's burrow. And after spawning, the male will receive the ball of fertilized eggs in its mouth where they will incubate until they hatch. So if you're looking at this photo on the right, you have to imagine at most this fish is four inches long. So all of those eggs that you're seeing in the mouth of that fish are teeny, teeny, tiny. One of the things that the yellow-headed jawfish does is will actually eject the eggs out of his mouth and then suck them back in. And by doing this, by rotating the eggs, it helps keep them clean and hydrated and sets them up for success once they hatch. Now, it wouldn't be Valentine's Day and it wouldn't be a conversation about mating behaviors if I left out seahorses. Seahorses are these very majestic, dancing, swimming fish. And so they will often swim by circling one another or circle a floating object and even change their colors. And very often they will, they will lock their tails or intertwine their tails during a courtship period that can last for days. It is said that they mate for life, but their full level of commitment to each other is questionable because if for some reason they become separated or if the male health goes downhill, the female may actually switch partners and stick with her original choice. And the thing that is probably most likely known about the seahorses is that the males experience pregnancy. During mating, the female seahorse will use a tube called an ovipositor to place her eggs into the male's frontal brood pouch. He will then incubate, nourish, and carry those eggs to term. Usually, it's a period of two to four weeks, depending on species. And similar to humans giving birth, 
he will give birth using contractions. And with these contractions, out will come the fully developed fry from dozens to hundreds to thousands. And these little baby newborn seahorses are immediately then drifting with water conditions. And of course, they're then vulnerable to predators. So you can see in this photograph how many there are. Not that many will make it beyond those first few days. As an aside, a fun trivia fact that you can use to impress your friends at dinner is that the genus name for seahorses, hippocampus, roughly translates from the Greek to horse-like horse sea monster, or by another translation, horse-like caterpillar. So let me know how that goes over when you socialize next. So we started in the vertebrate discussion talking about very, very small fish. Now we are gonna go to the biggest fish. And that's the Goliath grouper. So we went from the jawfish and the seahorse to the Goliath grouper, which is the largest fish in the tropical Western Atlantic. This fish can grow up to 800 pounds and eight feet long. They usually hit reproductively, reproductive maturity around four to five years old, but have been observed up to eight years old, which is, it's, that's pretty old for a reef fish. They can live to be the oldest track Goliath grouper was 37 years old. So they have a pretty intense lifespan. And Goliath grouper are protogenous hermaphrodites, which means that male fish develop from mature females or directly from the juvenile phase. So they are sex changing going from male to female. And these have pretty high sight fidelity, meaning once they find a place that they like, they tend to stick with it. However, they can, they do go the distance literally to form spawning aggregations. So they will migrate to sites and form these large aggregations of up to a hundred fish. And they have been tracked to have traveled up to 400 kilometers to gather in their spawning aggregation. And this happens during the summertime, usually August and September during the new moon. And so you'll see these large groups and it's said that their ability to boom or bark in which they are pulsing water across their gills and using their swim bladder is their way to communicate with one another. The female Goliath grouper will release eggs and the males release sperm. Once the eggs are fertilized, they are pelagic, meaning they drift in open water with currents. Those larvae will float around from anywhere from 30 to 80 days, which at that time of year puts them in the peak time of king tides, so our higher than normal seasonal high tides, which actually puts those larvae perfectly placed into their juvenile habitats, which are mangroves. Pretty cool. So now we're getting into some of our charismatic megafauna. And first we will talk about manatees. Manatees are reproductively active throughout most of the year, though their sexual activity tends to wind down during the winter. And that's because they're, they're slowing down, they're trying to conserve their energy to find warm water and to find food. Manatee lifespan can be up to 50 to 60 years old, and the females will reach sexual maturity around two to five years old. And at that point, they will begin seasonally entering that period of estrus or sexual activity. Some great places to go observe manatees in the Miami area include the Deering Estate, one of our Miami-Dade County Park sites, as well as Flamingo within Everglades National Park. It's almost a sure bet if you want to see manatee or manatees to go to either one of those places. It's almost a money back guarantee. Now, in certain areas, it seems like manatees will have rendezvous points. So the females will be in this period of estrus. And it's 
thought that they are releasing some sort of sensory cue into the water, whether it's some of those hormones, it's thought there might be scents associated with their urine. There's a couple of different hypotheses. And not just one male will be attracted to the female. Manatees will form mating groups, will form mating herds in which up to a dozen males will follow and huddle around a single female to mate with her. And this happens in really shallow water, which gives the manatees a little bit of leverage to physically, for the male to physically climb on top of the female. So those males that are closest to the female in the herd are the most dominant and aggressive, and those are the ones that have the best chance of actually mating. But the males on the outside of the group aren't just hanging around doing nothing. They are circling, they are waiting for their opportunity to get in there. It's almost impossible to know if or how the female chooses to mate with. And that's because there are so many individuals in these mating herds in the water that they stir up all the sediments. So it can be very challenging to identify individuals. And I thought it would be neat to show you a little bit of what this looks like. And this is an example posted by FWC. And you can see in shallow water near shore, a mating herd. And the male, that dominant male who wins out will swim underneath the female and line up head to head. And in doing this, that is how they inseminate the female for reproduction. And these mating herds can last for about two to four weeks and get pretty intense. Oftentimes with the females, will try to strand themselves on purpose in really shallow water just so they can get a break. And you have to remember that an adult manatee can weigh 800 to 1200 pounds. So all of this activity can be quite exhausting for the female. So you can't really blame her for wanting to wanting some space. Afterwards, once it's over, the males will move on and look for another female manatee. One thing I would definitely make sure to mention is that if you are in the water or near the water and you observe this behavior, definitely stay away and give them their space. Number one, because it is highly advised not to interact with manatees. And number two, because this actually can become pretty dangerous if you are in the water and be in contact with all of these animal animals who weigh so much. They're very focused on what they want to do. So you just want to observe from a distance. Okay, so once the female manatee is pregnant, their gestation period is about 385 to 400 days. So that's over a year. So for the moms who are listening right now, kudos to you. And we, have, you know, human women have it pretty easy compared to female manatees. Manatees will birth a single calf, although twins have been documented. And this is an example of lots of postnatal and parental care. That calf will remain with its mom for up to two years after birth. Immediately after its birth, the mom will bring the calf to the surface to teach it to breathe and how to gather food. And the calf will nurse from the mother underwater. So this is an example of case-selected species, whereas all of the examples, at least the fish examples we looked at, were our selected species, if we're tapping back to that ecology vocabulary. So the last example that I wanted to highlight for everybody is one of our other charismatic megafaunas, examples, species here in Florida, sea turtles. And sea turtle maturity age is slightly different based upon the species. And we have seven species of turtles in Florida with three that are the most common nesters on our beaches. The reproductive age estimated for leatherbacks on the upper left is as young as seven to 13 years old. For the loggerhead, about 25 to 35 years old. And for the green turtles, about 26 to 40 years old and their reproductive age is directly tied to the size of their carapace or that harder shell. So the larger individuals are those that are sexually mature. 
I wanted to give you all an idea, a rough idea of a sea turtle, sea turtle life. So thinking back, if we pick an average reproductive age of 15 to 20 years between the three species, at that time, those turtles were born, hatched out from a beach, made their way into the ocean, and grew up and survived to become adults. So here they are. They're living their best lives. They're eating, sleeping, and being merry. And then on March and April, they start to enter mating season. Once they mate, then comes nesting season in which the female turtles will leave the ocean and climb back onto the beach to lay their eggs. And this is apart from their birth, this is the only time that sea turtles voluntarily come back onto land. And then for the rest of the summer, creeping into fall is hatchling season when those nests and those eggs will hatch and the little baby turtles emerge and start the process over again. So how does this all happen? Well, one of the adaptations is that the male turtles will have these enlarged claws on their front flippers, as you can see here. And this aids the male turtles in grasping the shells of the females during mating. Two or more males may court a single female turtle. During this time, the breeding females and males will both return to the beaches where they hatch or in that general area. The females know it's a suitable nesting location, while males know that they will find female turtles there. And this mating behavior can take place at the surface or underwater. So this picture, there's a, there's a lot going on. Essentially, the male turtle will climb on top of the female turtle and inseminate the cloaca of the female, which is the opening of the female turtle that holds its reproductive organs and digest, not digestive and urinary organs too. So this can take several hours. The male will continue to hang out to prevent other males from mating. The other male turtles can be very aggressive and bite at the flippers and the tail of the breeding male to get a turn. And all of this is very, very risky because the female risks drowning if there are too many turtles on her. And she also can become very, very exhausted because imagine swimming around, you're talking several hundred pounds of turtle, double that and then triple that. And this whole process can take several hours. Once they're done, they will move on and breed again. And the female will stop once she has enough sperm to store for several months and fertilize all of her eggs. And all of that sperm leads to the genetic diversity of the egg clutches. All right, so we're gonna wrap this up now. What has everybody gotten from this? Well, if you didn't know already, it's tough being a parent. I am really glad that humans are case selected, that low offspring, low number of offspring. And, you know, are people going to go around asking you about R versus K? Are you going to do that? Probably not. But what I do want you to remember is that these reproductive strategies have evolved and all have their respective role to play to contribute to the balance and biodiversity that exists in the ocean. And the combination of these two particular traits is what has led us to what we have right now. And I hope that they, the reproductive strategies and the animals themselves will continue to adapt to face various stressors as we move forward in the 21st century. And likewise, these reproductive factors are things worth considering as different levels of protections are put into place, both for protecting a particular species and or protecting an entire habitat. And we are still just learning many things about all sorts of behaviors and reproduction. And as science advances, so will our understanding and our access to this information.
We're going to start to wrap up. I'm going to ask Ed to launch a very simple poll. And I'm just going to ask you one question. You can use your mouse to make a selection and then hit submit. And we're asking you to just tell us if you learned something. Either A, you strongly agree, as in you learned a lot. B, you learned something. Or C, you disagree, you did not learn anything new. So we appreciate this input. We'll give it a few more seconds for you all to make your choices. Before we wrap it up. So I think Ed, we can leave that open. And there are lots of science available about a lot of these different species and more. It was really hard to decide what to focus in on, but you know, when you have the microphone, you get the power. So I got to choose my favorites, <laughs> but if there are any that you're curious about, I would love to know as so I can look into and do some more research myself. So with that, I want to thank you once again and invite any questions into the chat. And I think Ed has some closing business to take care of.